welcome to the awesomers.com podcast. If you love to learn, and if you're motivated to expand your mind, and heck, if you desire to break through those traditional paradigms and find your own version of success, you are in the right place. Awesomers around the world are on a journey to improve their lives and the lives of those around them. We believe in paying it forward, and we fundamentally try to live up to the great Zig Ziglar quote, where he said, you can have everything in your life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. It doesn't matter where you came from, it only matters where you're going. My name is Steve Simonson, and I hope you will join me on this awesomer journey. If you're launching a new product manufactured in China, you will need professional, high-resolution, Amazon-ready photographs. Because Simo Global has a team of professionals in China, you will oftentimes receive your listings photographs before your product even leaves the country. This streamlined process will save you the time, money, and energy needed to concentrate on marketing and other creative content strategies before your item is in stock and ready for sale. Visit simoglobal.com to learn more, because a picture should be worth 1,000 keywords. This is episode number 56 of the Awesomers.com podcast series, and the insiders already know that all you have to do is go to awesomers.com slash 56 to get today's show notes details, summary, uh, even a link or two that we throw in there from time to time. All of that detail is waiting for you at awesomers.com slash 56. Now today, Rick Cesare is coming back to us for part two of this two-part series where we've been talking about how you can build a billion dollar brand. Now I want to reinforce, uh, Rick's book just dropped yesterday and today it's available for you as well. Go find the book and we'll put the links on the website as well. You can go to awesomers.com slash 56 to find the links. But we're going to buy his book because we want to learn how to build billion dollar brands. And we're going to leave a review about his book because we're good people and we pay it forward. And we understand when valuable content like this is delivered, we're going to do the right thing. Now, just a little bit about Rick's background in case you didn't join us in part one. He's helped major brands like GoPro, George Foreman Grills, The Juice Man, and many more build into massive, massive, well-known brands. I don't think there's anybody in America that you could go to and say, you know, have you heard of George Foreman and uh, Grill, and then say no. I, I certainly think even worldwide, the GoPro has become a phenomenon. In today's episode, we talk about the GoPro origin story and the OxyClean origin story. And, you know, really how these iconic brands were developed. In fact, Rick takes us back to the very beginning of GoPro when he found and met the founder at a trade show, kind of in a, a VW minivan with kind of a surfer vibe, and how that has, has built and created a, a life and a brand that has uh, taken on a life of its own, to be honest. So it's a really extraordinary opportunity to, to learn from somebody who's you know been doing direct response advertising for so many years, and it's a great privilege to have him come on two times in a row. So this is part two of our two-part series, and I know you're going to love it, and I know that you're probably going to share this, and you're probably going to like it, and you're probably even going to leave a review for awesomers.com, right? I know you wouldn't disappoint me. I look forward to reading your review online soon. Hey, Awesomers. Welcome back. Steve Simonson uh, joining you again here on the awesomers.com podcast, and uh, this is part two of our visit with Rick. Cesare. Cesare. Dang, I knew it. I was a 50-50 guy. You no, know, that's the same mistake everyone makes. <laughs> I swear to goodness that, uh, you know, I, I really do study. I try, I try, but uh, I fail. I, I try and I fail. So uh, my apologies uh, to Rick as usual because I, I get that wrong every time. And I could have gone back and listened to the tape, but I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure that, it, you know, anyway. So obviously I'm wrong yet again. So Rick, we have had a wonderful discussion. Uh, in our last episode about some of your origin and some of your background and diving deep into the Sonicare story and uh, learning all about the, the, uh, the taco machine that used to exist that uh, became the, the world famous George Foreman grill that had nothing to do with making tacos at the end of the day. Uh, and, and, but today I wanted to kind of have you freshen us up on, we're going to talk a little bit about your book, uh, which is Billion Dollar Brands. Yeah, building billion dollar brands. Billion, building billion dollar brands. And we'll make sure we have links to the, the book in the show notes, everybody. And by the way, because awesomers are pay it forward people, when we buy this book and we read this book, what's the next thing we do? We review this book and we leave those reviews on Amazon because we're good people. So we're going to get that done. 
And uh, but I'll, in addition to talking about the book and and kind of the the genesis for it, and you know, spoiler alert, it's probably related to your experience. But mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk about GoPro and OxyClean today because those are a couple of your other just a couple other examples. You know, we, we've already, we kind of skipped over Juice Man, which is another world famous brand. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. You know, we got to start and stop somewhere. So let's, let's talk about GoPro a little bit. What, what's your experience and how did you get into that one, Rick? Well, GoPro is a really interesting story. You know, I'm still, if your listeners remember from part one, I own a direct or had a direct response marketing agency, direct to consumer marketing agency. And, you know, we get a lot of new business from uh, referrals, people seeking us out because of the previous successes. But also one of the things I do just personally is I'll go to certain trade shows and just walk the floor and look for what I think are good products, good companies, something that, you know, interests me personally. So I was down at the outdoor retailers trade show in Salt Lake City and walking the floor and I came across this booth that really wasn't a normal trade show booth. The founder of the company, Nick Woodman, had driven his Volkswagen uh, bus onto the trade show floor. And he later told me he did that because he couldn't afford to buy a booth. And basically, um, you know, it's kind of an iconic symbol of a, of a surfer um, from the movie Endless Summer. And um, basically, he had set up a surf scene with the, with the Volkswagen bus. He had some sand, uh, some lounge chairs. But the product he was selling, he was selling this little camera out of the back of the bus, and he had a crowd around him. And for me, that's always the first indication of a product that potentially can be successful is you see a lot of people, you wonder what, what the excitement is, and they were excited about this little camera that uh, Nick had produced, which at the time was the GoPro camera. So we had a short conversation, but he was really busy, and I said, you know, I'd love to talk to you further about this. And... I guess he was interested in talking further because two weeks after the show, he flew to Seattle and we sat down and talked about his vision for the business. It was funny. I remember we went out to a little restaurant. Uh, you're from Seattle, Steve, so you know uh, a, a restaurant on South Lake Union. And um, also your listeners, that's where Amazon's located now, but this was pre probably uh, Amazon was still in its younger days at the time. But anyway, um, we, we, I remember he ordered um, a beer and chili cheese fries. That's what he had for lunch. And uh, we, we, uh, so he's a, he's a health nut just to be yeah, clear. Exactly. I got you. Okay, good. I just making sure the listeners at home are paying close attention. Carry on. <laughs> so we, uh, we proceeded to talk about his really his vision for the business and how we could help him. But it was really clear that he was passionate about what he was doing and he had talked at this initial meeting we had that his goal was to build a billion dollar business. And, you know, you'll never get to a certain point unless you actually set a goal or visualize um, doing it. And sometimes the goals can be really big. And in this case, they were. But I remember we talked about uh, a lot of the steps that, he, that the company actually followed over the next eight years to get to that threshold. And... Um, you know, again, I mentioned, I think, in the first interview that we did, the first part of the interview, sometimes you have the right product at the right time, at the right place, and the GoPro camera was another situation like that uh, from the standpoint of it was riding the wave of the selfie boom, where people were turning their cameras around and taking photos of themselves. And GoPros are good cameras, but if you think about the competition, um, you know, Sony, Panasonic, um, all the big camera companies could have had this technology or created the same technology. But what Nick did was really a very, you know, simple but genius type of thing. He developed mounts where you could, if you were extreme athlete or any type of athlete, where you could mount it on a helmet, the front of a surfboard, a ski pole, a mountain bike. And you could turn the camera around and take pictures of yourself and the product just exploded. I'm sure almost all of your listeners have heard or seen a GoPro. You can't really go anywhere on a ski slope or snowboarding slope without seeing them. Yeah, if we if if awesomers out there don't know the GoPro story, we're going to vote you off the island because it's uh, you, you don't have to know the story, but you certainly know the product. And I, I want to reinforce one of the points that Rick has made 
and, and maybe even unpack a couple of the little uh, 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 lessons that I picked up along the way. First of all, Rick, a as we talk about in many episodes, he was out there networking. He was out there at trade shows. He was putting himself out there to see what's what, right? And, and here's this, here's this world-class brand that we all know today. And we know that it has passed that, uh, you know, billion dollars uh, threshold. Um, but, you know, they started just like a lot of us, right? It just a, a little, you know, we couldn't afford a booth. So we just kind of had to uh, fake our way until we make our way. And, yeah. and that's what the founder did. And, but they struck up a conversation and then that's now both people are saying, all right, what are the possibilities? How do I leverage his experience? How do I leverage that product? But the, the biggest part to me, and, and Rick really talked about this uh, very well, it's just a camera, right? <laughs> There's a million other people that have cameras. He, he took that camera and he made it something special with all the mounts, with all of the applications and, and kind of made it like, Hey, if, if you are cool and if you're going to be out there surfing, if you're going to be out there snowboarding down a mountain, there's only one choice. You're not going to go to Sony or Panasonic or Nikon. You're going to go to GoPro and, and that's it. And, and their, their little tagline, be a hero is so perfect because everybody, anytime they read or watch a movie, right? You read a, a great story, watch a movie, you always visualize yourself as a hero. So absolutely. The, the, and and the basically, looks, yeah. yeah, I'd love to go into, let's go into a little bit more detail because Please. it kind of ties together old school, basic direct response marketing techniques with new school technology and, and, and you know, behind the scenes look at some of the success with GoPro. But you were absolutely right. I, I was about to bring up the tagline, be a hero. And from an emotional attachment, everybody wants to be a hero. And one of the things they did, let's talk about a marketing and um, they used influencers. Uh, in the old days, let's go back to Sonicare toothbrush, we called them key opinion leaders. And we got the top dentist, the top uh, periodontist in the country to endorse our product, bringing credibility to it. So Nick had an action camera. The influencers he got were the top um, surfers, the top mountain bikers, all the top extreme athletes, and he gave them free cameras. That's another important point um, that if you want to get people talking about your product, I always, I'm a big believer in giving them away for free, whatever the product is, getting to the right people, getting people to talk about them. And again, you're expanding the awareness of, of the product. So Nick did that and, and got a lot of extreme athletes using, using the cameras. So the second thing that happened is everyone likes to take pictures of themselves, post them online. And what Nick did, they, people would do that to their own followings. But then he also, the GoPro site, was a place where you could go to see all these cool videos and then people would come there and, and share them. And, you know, that's one of the, you know, foundational reasons that the product took off. But from a marketing perspective, we did something where we tied old school thinking into kind of a little bit of new school. We never created um, long infomercials for this. Every GoPro spot was 30 seconds. And we had a specific format that we used that, that, uh, did a couple things, and I recommend when people are making videos, I think we might have mentioned this before, every GoPro spot starts with a brand logo. So immediately, you know when you're watching a GoPro spot what the commercial's about. And, and you, you know if you turn on TV, if any of your listeners watch, still watch TV, you see a commercial, half the time you don't know what the heck they're talking about till it's over. So right away, they, with the brand logo up front, you know it's a GoPro spot. Then, then in the middle, like an Oreo cookie, user-generated footage, and then at the end, and this is where the direct response came in, basically we said at the end of every spot, we, we said, go to our website, which is the gopro.com, and, regist and uh, register for our contest. Someone will win one of everything we make every single day. So what that did was you were giving people a reason to go to the site. So number one, you're driving tr new traffic to the site. People would go to the site, see those cool videos, share them with their friends, creating a little bit of a viral marketing effect. The second thing that happened, because you had to register for the contest and win cool GoPro stuff, we were collecting email addresses and creating a database where we could remarket uh, the product to people, get them to buy it, you know, basic e-commerce. Um, and then the third thing, by driving people to the site, some people just 
made the decision to buy the camera. So we were generating revenue at the same time. But it was really a basic direct response technique at the end of what would be considered kind of a normal commercial, although the GoPro commercials were, were pretty cool um, in themselves. But again, it's that, it's that utilizing those concepts in a little bit different way um, to, to create the, the, um, the success of the, of the product. It is a it is really a, a nice adaptation to be able to kind of tie in, you know, the Nirvana is user generated content, by the way, everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, that's Facebook loves user generated content. Their whole business is built around it. They produce almost nothing, yet their site is filled daily, right? Uh, YouTube's the same way, user generated content. So GoPro, you know, took this concept of hey, everybody's liking, you know, this these beautiful videos, and some of them are quite spectacular. That that's the part where I think the GoPro founder uh, is so brilliant is, you know, he got these angles that were so unique. Nobody ever mm -hmm. really contemplated, you know, having the actual thing on the surfboard itself, you know, right. and, or if they did, it certainly wasn't popularized. And mm -hmm. he was able to lead that popularization. And now when you see some of these videos, whether they're snowboarders or surfers or even just people running or mountain biking, it's right. pretty amazing. And, and right. people get enthusiastic about it. So that energy seems to, be, be imparted to the brand halo to some extent. Right. So let's let's just dive a little bit deeper again from a strategy standpoint, just to show you how they built this into into a billion dollar business. So their niche or the niche that they dominated and became the cool product or the brand was extreme athletes. But and then people wanting to be like the extreme athletes. But if you think about it, that's a fairly um, small niche in the mass consumer market. So at some point, GoPro needed to expand out of there. And, and there's a very definitive, we started, you know, all of the early spots that we were helping them make were, um, you know, the extreme athletes. Then you'll see a transition and you'll start to see people using it to film their pets. Um, and I, one of my favorite videos uh, is of a French bulldog on the beach. And it's just, you know, that beautiful footage and watching it go around. And you're implanting the idea in people's minds, hey, I can use this camera for more than just extreme athletes. And, and, then, and then there's a family picture of a family riding down a hill in their backyard in a toboggan. And uh, really, really cool videos, but really expanding the marketplace from extreme athletes to a much larger audience. But again, you know, we talked um, in the first part of the interview about positioning and how, and it's important to find a category, regardless of how big or small it is that you feel your product or service can dominate. Well, GoPro came out and dominated the extreme athlete, dominated that category, and then they were able to expand outside of that. Yeah, it, it is really, it's brilliant marketing, uh, number one, but it's, it's also, you know, a way to to not just reach the mass market, but a way to, you know, kind of show people, hey, this is how you use it, right? It starts mm -hmm. with the extreme athletes and you get that credibility. And that, you know, anybody, you know, kind of, again, they, they visualize themselves as a hero. I, I could do that uh, extreme snowboarding if I really wanted to, right? And it's like, no, no, not yeah. a chance. I, you know, get uh, a little dizzy going down a, a slide at a kid's park. So uh, by then taking the dog and taking the family and, and taking these other applications, people then can see themselves, you know, using that camera on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, I know for myself, I bought my son one of their cameras. It was probably at least four or $500. And, and I probably bought him another $100 worth of accessories that he could, you know, I don't even, I'm not sure he's ever actually used a camera if you want to know the truth. <laughs> but I thought it was cool enough and that it would give him the chance to go edit. And, and all of those messages that you guys were, you know, engineering way back in the day still work, you know, e even yeah. on, on these uh, recent years. So uh, what, what did you guys kind of do next to, or where did the, so the two, yeah, two, happen? two things I want to just mention, you mentioned accessories. Sure. I remember watching an episode of Shark Tank and there was a company that was doing nothing but selling GoPro accessories and making 8 million a year. And I think they were doing primary selling primarily on Amazon and they were looking for money to fund their business. So here's a, a, a very successful company doing nothing but, um, you know, piggybacking on the success of GoPro just on the accessory area. But, you know, I, this is a great next step because where GoPro really made the switch from 
one, like a hundred million to a billion, which is 10 times the size. And I've heard you, you know, first, Steve, first you alluded to it in the mastermind group when we first met, the Catalyst 88 mastermind group, um, about the brick and mortar mass market consumer. And that's really where the tremendous of Go GoPro came in. So they had this great foundation of direct to consumer marketing as a very profitable business, but they wanted to get out everywhere. And so they basically had a trial with Best Buy and uh, Best Buy was located. They, I think they, at the time we were doing this, I don't know if the number's still correct. They had like a thousand stores across the country. And a lot of times a big store like that will do a regional test and they'll, they'll basically um, put you in a few stores. If they have to do it well, they'll, they'll do the whole chain. And so Best Buy headquarters, just like Target headquarters, is in Minneapolis. And so one of the things when the test started is we blanketed the Minneapolis uh, TV market with GoPro ads so that the executives would be seeing that. And it's just a little thing, but it, I've done this before with Walmart, and it's very inexpensive to buy time in, in Arkansas and, and, and Minneapolis to, to get enough exposure to make an impression on the executives of those stores. Um, but anyway, their, their growth really happened when they got into uh, the brick and mortar. And so it, it goes back to now, when I talk to companies about a, a, a approach to building a big company or building a billion dollar company, or let's just say you wanna build a $10 million company, I would say there's like three legs to the stool. And Amazon is one leg, obviously. You, you need to establish and be successful there e-commerce and your online presence, which includes your social media and you know your direct-to-consumer sales from your website and your content on your website is the other leg. And then the third leg, um, for me at least still for certain products, is being able to have a, a successful direct response TV campaign if, you're, if your company is bigger. But you can also supplant that. We talked earlier about doing a successful Facebook campaign or whatever. As long as you have some type of engine where you're getting a return and you can put those ad dollars back into the engine that kind of drives the awareness. And it's kind of a simple model um, that a lot of companies could execute on. Uh, but one thing I find um, with a lot of the people that are doing Amazon only, it's like Amazon is the be all end all and they're missing out on a lot of business and also they're missing out on a way of protecting themselves, I feel, um, should something change on Amazon. So, Well, this is a very important point and I appreciate you kind of shining the light on it. So the, the first thing is, you know, I have, I have a number of axioms. Uh, I call them axioms. It's because I'm a marketeer at heart. And otherwise, it would just be the crazy old man in the corner who keeps repeating himself. So now it's a good thing, right? They're axioms. It's a rule so, or an axiom yeah, or a right, secret. Yeah. That's right. So one of the axioms is, in my opinion, and these are self-generated, so they could be wrong, but uh, you cannot have a world-class brand in a single channel. Now, it doesn't mean you can't have a world-class product or a great business that builds equity, but a true world-class brand exists across multiple channels. And for the reasons which you kind of you know, alluded to slightly is you know, there's diversification matters, not just to reach new customers, but for the risk profile. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, one of my, uh, a brand I bought about a year ago, uh, Amazon just has, has wiped every review that product ever had. Yep. Now, do I think it's fair? No, I don't particularly think it's fair. Uh, Amazon has their reasons and, and you know, we can fight about it and so forth. And, and I have no problem with how great Amazon is a marketplace opportunity. That's the, you know, the upside to it, but there's also risk. And that, that product could be a dead duck now. I mean, I, I may just have to fold up that company because starting from scratch to get new reviews and you know, who knows even that process, how long it will take, it's a daunting task. So that, that's a big risk. And, you know, I've made luckily plenty of money since buying that company and it's, it's more than monetize itself, probably five or 10 times over in just a year. It's, it's right. done okay for me, but it's, it's relatively small. But the, the point is there is risk on being in a single channel and you don't know what's going to happen. So for that reason, that's a good reason to consider diversification. Uh, but for the other reason of reaching a larger market, that's another equally good reason. And as you said, I, I think very eloquently, you can start out with, you know, a reasonable budget. You don't have to start out with a million bucks on nationwide, you know, kind of infomercials or TV right. webinars. You can start with, you know, Facebook or 
doing your own you know, kind of webinar series. And so the other axiom that this finally ties into is, you know, you have to be able to pour um, money in the top of the funnel and have profit come out of the bottom of, bottom of the funnel to have a sustainable business, to have a true business. That's how it works. You have to pour money in the top of the funnel and it has to produce profit out of the bottom of the funnel on a predictable basis. That's when you have something that could scale. Uh, what, what do you think about those axioms? I, I, I 100% agree with everything you're, you're saying. And I like the fact that you're bill, uh, boiling it down to just a really simple concept as far as putting money in the top of the funnel and then getting it out at the bottom. And really that equates to what I mentioned before about the advertising. If in, in us, there's different rules, but if we spend a dollar on advertising, we need to see a minimum return of $2. Um, and sometimes that's just a break even. Otherwise that advertising channel isn't working for us. And so again, it's that analogy, the money goes into the top, you put a dollar in, you want to get $2 or more out of the bottom. The more you get out of the, the bigger and faster you can build the, the, the business. So absolutely agree with it. And the other one that ties into what you said, uh, the, there's lots of reasons for the diversification. The last one I want to just add to that is that I'm a big believer at another simple concept. Let the consumer buy the product where they want to purchase the product. And I know when you're a, a young business, you can't be everywhere and available to everyone. But once you've successfully mastered one channel, start looking at some other channels because you can't control consumer behavior. And the way you become this billion dollar company or, or big brand that's well known is really the, your product is um, everywhere or everywhere that the consumer wants to purchase it. Because People have different shopping habits. And I think you mentioned this before, Steve, that Amazon, as big as it is, is a small percentage of the total uh, amount of, of, of revenue where people are purchasing. Totally right, yeah. And th that's, you know, I, I'm, I really appreciate the fact that you drive this point home. And, you know, as, as marketeers or as brands, our obligation is to make it easy on our customers to the greatest extent we can, right? And mm -hmm. if there's some people, uh, you know, they buy their product at, you know, whatever, Target. That, that's just what they do. That's their shopping habits. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean they never have been on Amazon or they've never bought anything online. But if, they're, if that's where they shop and you're not in Target, you may never get a shot at that customer, period. Mm -hmm. That's just the way things are. And, right. and so I really do uh, appreciate and agree with that. So when we're going to take a quick break, when we come back, I want you to think about, um, you know, the, any stories or any anecdotes you care to share about that tipping point with GoPro. And then uh, we're also going to talk about OxyClean and we're going to do all that right after this break. Empowering. The name says it all. Connecting e-commerce entrepreneurs with great people, ideas, systems, and the services needed to stay business dynamic and to grow. Empowery is a network, a cooperative venture of tools and resources to make you better at what you do, because we love what you do. We are you. Visit Empowery.com to learn more. Okay, gang, we're back again. Steve Simonson joined by Rick Cesari. What do you think? I Got it right, Steve. Well, you know, I'm 50% on the day, and, you know, good Lord, if I have to pronounce it again, it could go either way. So, uh, so anyway, Rick, I, I, before the break, I tease this idea of, uh, any tipping point or anecdotes uh, re related to GoPro that, that may be interesting to the Osmers out there because there's so many little phases a company goes through and so many moments, defining moments, if you will, that companies go through. I'm, I'm just curious if any stand out to you. Yeah, I, I have an example. Um, it's a little bit um, higher, higher level from the standpoint of the company was – doing quite a bit of revenue when this happened, but we talked before about getting the distribution in um, Best Buy, and that happened in the fall. I forget the exact year. It's, um, uh, but you know, the fall for brick and mortar stores is the, you know, they do two thirds of their sales in the fourth quarter. And so they were able to get that, that distribution through all the Best Buy stores uh, in the fall quarter. And one of the things that kind of put things over the top, and this is uh, funny because uh, in the TV, it's kind of like the Holy Grail, like, okay, let's run a Super Bowl ad. 
and 90% of the people that run Super Bowl ads or companies that run them do them. It's an ego driven thing. Um, and from a, again, from a direct response marketer, it's not a good place to run ads. But we, again, approach things a little bit differently from a marketing perspective. If it, there's no way you could pay $3 million for one 30 second Super Bowl ad and get it to pay off. Um, and again, I'm using the mentality of a two to one return minimum. Um, but what we do were able to do is go in and do um, something what they call local placement. So we took the top um, probably 10 markets in the country um, and you can buy what they call local insertion. So we spent a fraction, I don't know if the Super Bowl ads were running like a $3 million for 30 seconds at the time. We were able for a couple hundred thousand dollars to get about 80% of the same audience. And when you know that happened, um, we did the same thing with the Olympics. If you go and buy network time, it's really, really expensive. And then here's another, and so that was kind of a tipping point to really kind of ingrain it as this big, you know, national brand, um, that type of thing. And then the other little key, and again, this is a little bit TV oriented, and um, but one of the aspects of doing direct response advertising versus the brand advertising you mentioned before is brand advertisers pay rate card or the most expensive rates. And um, I'll give you an example. If you're uh, Procter & Gamble and you want to be in Good Morning America, you, you're, you're in Good Morning America, you know your spot's going to run at 8.30 in the morning. So if we want that audience, that same audience, we'll go to the, at Good Morning America and say, we want a direct response rate. We, we want to air anytime between 7 and 9 a.m. We don't care when that is. And we get the time from 20 to 40% less than the, the big brands paying for it. So it's kind of like a little bit of specialized guerrilla marketing that helped really implant the, the, the GoPro commercials in people's minds. Well, I just love that scrappy mentality, right? Even as the company's growing and has tens yeah. of millions, even hundreds of millions of sales, by taking that, that scrappy you know, mentality of, hey, how do we get more? How do we, how do we get more for less? That's a, that's, you know, another axiom, by the way. And this, this premise that, you know, you can have some large exposure, whether it's the Super Bowl or on Good Morning America or at Olympics and, and doing it strategically, that just goes to show that knowledge and experience really has extraordinary value. I, I love those kind of stories. And, and uh, I think every awesomer can understand the potential impact for it and really start to do the math that, you know what, it's not unreasonable to expect you know, to use television in some way in the future. There, there's lots of different ways to do it. And we could talk about uh, variations of that. So I, I really love GoPro as a brand. Um, you know, they, obviously they've gone public and they've had their ups and downs with, with sales and growth and this and that. But the product itself was wonderful. The brand is wonderful. The marketing was masterful. Uh, how did, uh, how did the, the founder cope with all this? So did the founder stay in place the whole time? Or, you know, this kind of growth can be pretty well, yeah, you know, this is again, and and it's really interesting. There's lots of fun stuff from a marketing perspective, talking about how these companies grow, become brands, but you also get a really good glimpse into the management, which is the other side of creating a successful business. If you don't have good management systems in place, good people in place, um, you're never going to be able to get over a certain level. And you know this from running, running businesses. So it's another thing that's very important. So kind of going back to GoPro, two, two things happened and um, Amazon ties into it. Um, with any, any product, no matter how successful the brand, that gives you a lot of protection because people seek out the brand, you can charge more money. Um, knockoffs started coming in from China. And um, your <laughs> listeners are familiar with that. So you were talking about a $300 GoPro camera or more. Well, you could buy GoPro lookalikes, knockoffs, whatever, I, you know, as cheap as like 39 or $49. And so that created some erosion. Now, they still have a viable business, but that's just something that your brand's going to give you some protection, but just something that happens. But Kind of the completion of the story, um, you know, about the founder, 
he was a guy who uh, was a surfer at heart. So when the company went public, um, he enjoyed his success. And if you go ahead and Google um, Nick Woodman, uh, I think you'll see pictures. I think he bought a 180 foot yacht with a helicopter on the back. And he goes down and spends a lot of time uh, on surf trips in Nicaragua. And, um, and you know, anyway, he deserved to, to enjoy the, the, the rewards of his success. So that's kind of how, how he chose to um, spend his money, which is great. Yeah, uh, yeah. Hey, it's definitely, you know, if you're living the dream, you're living that dream. I love it. But if you, uh, if you also look at a stock chart of GoPro, um, they, they were really high at one point, and then they had a dramatic falling. And there's also a parallel to kind of the CEO maybe taking his eye off the ball a little bit. I'm not criticizing at all. I probably would have done almost the same exact thing. So, Well, I think this is a, you know, it's a, first of all, you know, anybody who decides what their lifestyle that they want and they get to achieve it, kudos to them, no problem. Yep. But let, let's not, uh, you know, be naive and think that, you know, the, the success that got you there and the kind of momentum and the leadership that got you there uh, won't need to be carried on in some way. And right. so, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that go on with these uh, companies. And I think it's a great brand. I think it's a great story. And, uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled that you're able to share it with us. Uh, I, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about OxyClean, which is, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the broad range of the products you've dealt with show really it's about marketing right it's about mm -hmm. brand building it's not about the individual product and oxyclean is one of those crazy examples for me how did this become such a, a big brand that everybody knew can you take us back to the beginning how did it start sure that's another one and again you mentioned the book building billion dollar brands that that's going to be coming out um actually it's released september 24th but it, you know you can um go online and get a pre pre registration for it or my website even. Um, but my point is when I talk about this every, and I think I mentioned this earlier in part one, almost every one of these companies that are now recognizable brands, I started working with when they were doing very low sales and nobody knew what they were. So let's go back to the very beginning of the OxyClean story. Um, the company was founded uh, by a gentleman named Max Apple, and I think Max is probably in his 80s right now, a wonderful entrepreneurial guy. He was probably in his 60s when he started the company, but just kind of a lifelong entrepreneur, trying new things, and his son, Joel Apple, and, and Joel was a um, marketing executive, I believe, at, at um, Nestle or, or Quaker Oats. That's what, what where he was. And so, basically, their first product was a furniture polish called Orange Glow. And the name of the parent company of OxyClean was called Orange Glow International. And their very first product, again, they made it a little unique. Everyone knows about Lemon Pledge and you use lemon scented furniture polish. Their unique part was this, was we're gonna use orange oil. And that's what they did different. And the only way they were selling it, they were selling it on the Home Shopping Network in Clearwater, Florida. And they were having uh, quite a bit of success. And I'm not sure exactly um, how they met Billy Mays, but Billy was the person who was the on-air personality selling the orange glow. And their very first infomercial wasn't for OxyClean. It was for orange glow furniture polish. And Billy wasn't in that. So hmm. we're going back again a ways. We're, it's 1996. And they were going to launch this new product that they had tested. And, and here's an interesting concept. They would test products and on the fair circuit. And I don't know if any of your listeners have ever been to a state fair. There's always a section of every state fair where you see all these booths and people are pitching products. And that's where they started pitching the orange glow and showing demos, getting people to buy it. And again, if you can have success, uh, creating a sales pitch at that level, then the way you grow a big business is let's take that sales pitch that we know works. People are responding to it, even if it's one-on-one. -on -one. How can we apply technology to that to show more people 
that exact sales pitch. And we talked about webinars, we talked about TV, we talked about Facebook advertising. But at the bottom, the foundation is creating a successful sales pitch. So they went out, tested OxyClean on the fair circuit, had a, had a lot of success, knew it was a viable product. And um, we made Billy Mays's, I don't know if any of your listeners know Billy Mays, he's, he's passed oh, sure. away now, but at one time he was probably the world's best pitch man. And, um, uh, just a dynamic personality. So we made his very first infomercial in 1996 for OxyClean. And um, that one, unlike the George Foreman grill, just from the very moment it hit the air, we were getting a four to one return on our ad dollars. And you know, at that point, go back to your example. If you, we, we are, our initial media test is $20,000. We put it on a bunch of stations across the country, got some feedback. So that 20 turned into 80. So what did we do with the 80? We put it in the top of the funnel and that 80 turned into 320. And pretty soon they were spending a million bucks a month on media. And the thing is, when you're growing a business like this very quickly, in addition, and again, you know this and a lot of your listeners know this, you're spending your media dollars, but at the same time, you have to spend money on inventory. So Every business, no matter how successful, is always cash strapped, especially the faster they grow, the more cash strapped they are. Um, so that's really what holds most businesses back. And the nice thing about the OxyClean business was it was a very organic uh, growth. I mean, they were able to fund their entire growth just from the profits of the direct consumer marketing. And again, this is all happening pre-Amazon. There were only two legs to the stool. There was TV and then there was online. And even online at that point wasn't fully mature yet so um so you know again but it's still the same same principle so with the oxyclean you know one of the things that they did really well and i think it's a good lesson for people who are single product companies they had the orange glow furniture polish they had the oxyclean they came out with another product kaboom tub and tile cleaner and they had a family of products that again, took up a lot of space on the retail shelf. And I'll skip to the end of the story. We can come back and talk about a lot of details. But the end of the story is this little family business that was started in Denver, Colorado, was able to sell out to a, a big company called Church and Dwight that makes Arm & Hammer, um, or owns Arm & Hammer brand for $325 million. And probably the reason that they got were able to get so much money was they they basically took away so much self shelf space in the cleaning section of every grocery store across the country that their competitors like Procter and Gamble and Clorox and and in this case Church and Dwight said they're stealing shelf space from us we better buy that and and that's what happened so I love that and and we'll come back to some of those details. Uh, it is very interesting to, to hear that reference because I actually also had a, a case where we kept taking space from in big boxes from some of the major brands. Mm -hmm. And, and we, uh, at some point, a, a Chinese factory said, Hey, we want to buy you. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not opposed to it. You know, let's make the deal. Right. And mm -hmm. the word got out. We got a couple more offers all unsolicited. We never put anything out there. And then we had one of the big brands that we had been taking shelf space show up and, and more or less, they're like, hey, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because their their premise was they needed that shelf space back, right? And yeah. I'm sure that part of that um, acquisition and part of what drove the value was Church and Dwight, if that's the right name, um, they, they wanted to get some of that shelf space back through whatever means necessary, including buying yeah. those brands that were taking the space. Yeah, in the case of Church and Dwight, it was a combination, uh, it was a combination of getting some back, but for them, it was able to, they're this, if you look at the companies, Clorox, Procter & Gamble with Tide and all of that, for Church & Dwight, they were kind of the smaller company. And for them, it was a way of expanding their shelf space in one acquisition. So that was their philosophy or mentality. So brilliant. So we're going to come back and talk about it, maybe a couple of the defining moments or tipping point in the building of that great brand, OxyClean. We're going to do that right after this break. Hey, Amazon Marketplace professionals, congratulations on your success to date. Your creativity, strategic vision, problem solving, and discipline have allowed you to build your own e-commerce business. 
Wouldn't it be great if you had more time to focus on the things that truly drive the sales and growth of your company? Instead of getting lost in a dozen different services and countless spreadsheets, what if there was one system that connected to your Amazon account and automatically gave you the information that you needed to make great decisions and really impact your business? Parsimony ERP can do that. Parsimony is the business operating system for your marketplace business. With Parsimony, you get true double entry bookkeeping, easy financial statements, full customer service tools, and items item by item profitability, along with project and task management, and more features are being added all the time. Learn more at parsimony.com. That's parsimony, P-A-R-S-I-M-O-N-Y.com. Parsimony.com. We've got that. Okay, we're back, everybody. Steve Simonson joined by Rick Cesari, and I think I'm two out of three on the on the day. What do you yeah, think? You got, it, you got it nailed now. All right, man. Uh, it's I, I will apologize in advance for the next time I screw it up, but... Uh, you know, I love going through these billion dollar brand stories and, and I, I just want to remind awesomers out there that these things, everybody started the same way we did. They started mm -hmm. as small businesses and they just started thinking about, you know, unique ways of getting out to the market. I mean, how many of us now would ever consider of going and testing the, the, uh, the fair market, you know, the, the state mm -hmm. fair market. But I can tell you every state fair I go to, there are at least you know a dozen or more booths and the guy's got the you know the 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 uh microphone and the you know he's he's pumping out the pitch and and they all want to be like billy mays of course right the Absolutely. most famous pitch man ever and they're selling everything from knives to you know um you know barbecue equipment and, and so on and so forth and i, I just want to remind customers out there that not only is amazon not the only game in town e-commerce is not the only game in town there's just a lot of ways to test and and validate your product. And then when you find something that works, that's when you, you double down or triple down or, or whatever you got to do. So uh, t take us into maybe where OxyClean, you said from the very beginning, you started the infomercials, you got great ROI. W was there any tipping point or challenges along the way that became defining moments later? Um, you know, one, one thing that, well, well, let me go back and, and, and go pr like we talked about the very beginning of OxyClean and one, a funny story about before we ever started engaging with them and doing business. And again, you're from Seattle, you might recognize this other product. I was already on the air with another cleaning product called Quick and Bright. I don't know if you've ever heard of that or run into that Vaguely one. familiar, yeah. Anyway, it was, a, it was a very effective product. The infomercial was working great. But I, me I mentioned earlier about one of the things that you need to be able to go from a smaller business to a larger business is having the right management structure in place. And that was a company where they didn't do the right things from a management perspective and didn't have some success. But the, 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 the point of the story was the two founders of, Oxy, of OxyClean, Max and Joel Apple, they wanted us to do business. And I kept saying no, because it was a, a competitive, I was already in the space, I was had another client, and I probably told them no for about three or four months before I finally said, okay, we'll, we'll take this on and, and, and do it, we'll just keep them really separate. And the fact that they were in different, cat, they were in the cleaning category, but different types of cleaning type of thing. So anyway, that was just kind of a funny thing that we didn't actually start working with them right away. Um, again, on the on the on the tipping point for this, and I, I don't know if it's going to be totally relevant to all your listeners. When you um, make an info an infomercial you're a small mom and pop business, you're selling at state fairs, you're selling at home shopping network, you, you spend a couple hundred thousand dollars to make this half hour TV show, you do the media test, as soon as you get those numbers back um, where you're getting a four to one return on your ad dollars, all of a sudden I can probably project out they were a couple million dollars in sales and I would say, without hesitation, just from that uh, first weekend of media testing, I knew we could build this into a $50 million business because what we did is we had an advertising vehicle that was returning, you know, what we needed to on our ad dollars. And again, the, the lesson to apply from that is it doesn't have to be TV. Any advertising vehicle you could get that returns like that you can use it to leverage and build build the business. So that was the, the, the one tipping point. The other thing that happened 
um, quite consistently, and again, this is kind of just kind of eyes wide open as you're building your brand, building your business, um, one, some of the landmines or hurdles, and it happened both in, in Sonicare and with OxyClean. In the case of Sonicare, the big 800 pound gorillas in the space at the time, which was Braun uh, Oral-B, basically attack you and try to keep you because you're threatening them and they attack you by um, uh, basically turning you into the different you know, regulatory boards, even if you're doing everything all right, and then they sue you for whatever reason and they figure a small company will tie you up in court, make you waste your resources, make you unfocused off of what the goal is. That happened with Sonicare when they were growing it with and, and you know, versus Braun and Oral-B. And then it also happened with OxyClean. In this case, Clorox came in, said, we want to do due diligence, came in, looked at everything, everything, their books, their marketing, everything, then came back and basically um, tried to shut down the company by starting lawsuits and things. And again, a lot of times you don't have to worry about that till you're starting to, um, you're, you're like a mosquito on, on, the, on the big big person or big company. Um, but both of those things are kind of things that happen as you're, as you're growing and, and successful. But a long winded answer to your original question, the tipping point in almost all these businesses is when we found the advertising vehicle that was giving us a return on our investment, we knew then that we could use that to, to turn it into a big business. And, you know, you talk about the branding, you, you've heard the term um, building the airplane as you fly it. Oh yes. Yeah, so Almost every one of these brands, you don't sit there with a branding company and spend tens of thousands of dollars picking out colors and logos and things. I'm a believer, and I think I mentioned this earlier, and I think you 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 too, get the product out there, get people buying it, get their feedback, make some changes, get it back out there, or keep it out there, and you're kind of developing the brand as you go based on consumer feedback. And that's just kind of a really foundational philosophy that I have. It's, it is good. I definitely share that. Uh, we have, uh, we've had pictures in our office of building the airplane while we fly it. We definitely <laughs> believe in kind of just moving fast and iterating as quick as we can. Uh, but a couple of things I want to call out to the Oscars out there listening. Uh, the first is don't be surprised the more successful you are when a lightning bolt strikes. You, you will be sued by somebody. It doesn't matter if the suit has merit. You, you can still be sued, right? And, and sometimes it's nefarious competitors. Sometimes it's just trolling, you know, patent or other kind of lawyers who've found some little wrinkle in the law that they want to exploit. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, don't be surprised when this happens. You want to do what you can to prevent it, but, you know, you can't prevent everything. So don't be surprised when it happens. And the other thing is, you know, just remember that every brand, you know, they, they started somewhere. They started with an idea. And all of these brands, I think, have in common that they had margin, right? You, and we talked about this in the first uh, part of this episode, uh, part one. You, if you don't have margin, you can't sustain the marketing. You can't double down on, you know, uh, marketing. Because if, if even with your great return, if, you know, it's like, hey, we spent 20000 in ads and it's 80000 of sales. Uh, but the product is 60,000 in sales. So now we just broke even. It's like, no, that, you know, you, you can't run a business like that. You actually have to have a margin. Is that something you fundamentally agree with, Rick? I absolutely 100% agree with it. When we're analyzing, you know, we have a lot of um, companies come to us with products and they're having some success in, in some area, whether it's Amazon or somewhere else. The very first thing I ask, one question, which talks about margin is, what are you selling it for and how much does it cost for you to make it? And there's lots and lots of great products out there that don't have the right margin for us to do our direct to consumer marketing. Um, and it just, the margin dollars are so important. So you learn to say no to products that are, that have a following that have some success. Um, however they got there, but you can't layer in the mass marketing techniques that you need to get to a much bigger, bigger level without the correct margin. So it's really, and actually, you know, if you're looking for products to launch for the first time, 
really look at the numbers first and make sure there's a margin. I mean, there's, there's, there's not a, a great rule of thumb, but if you don't have at least a three to one markup, you're not going to have a chance of success. And that's very, very little minimum. And the only exception to that is, is if there's a continuity, um, you, you know, that people can reorder. But again, you're going to need a little bit deeper po pockets because you basically take into account the lifetime value of the customer. Like if they order your supplement or they order your cream, how many times are they going to reorder once you have spent your money to obtain that customer? So we get into, you talk about the margin, we get into a very sophisticated financial analysis before we ever get involved with any product to make sure that the numbers work. And I think you can write that down as one of the basic rules is uh, make sure the numbers work or how or the margin is there. And that's, I not only agree with it, it's kind of like a, a another one of those axioms you have to follow. Yeah, I like that. Uh, I like it. The fact that Rick's on board with the axioms instead of me being a crazy person in the corner, <laughs> repeating the same stuff over and over again. Um, Rick, let's talk about the book. Um, and, and maybe tell me, uh, when, you, when did you decide to write it and why did you decide to write this newest book? Because you also have another book as well in the past. Yeah, so it's interesting. My first book came out in 2011. It's called Buy Now. And that talks about, uh, that goes into really good deep detail on the Trillium Health products and the Juice Man business and my early, we talked in part one about my earlier career and degree in bio, you know, everything kind of um, up through the George Foreman grill. But you know, that I felt there was a lot of information that wasn't communicated in the book. And what it dawned on me um, was that almost every one of these products I worked on, we used, you know, they all had certain criteria then you know we just talked about margin um, and we always did certain things to help make them successful so what the building billion dollar brands about is really exploring um, you know I have something available to your listen to five keys to building a great brand that comes from the book um, building billion dollar brands and it's like five things that you need to look at or put in place if you want to rise above the other products out there. And so it was really the book came about of just trying to put together information that could help people when they were launching a product or starting a new business, uh, looking at it. And my, my uh, co-author in the book, Barb Westfield, she says, I'm the optimist and she's the realist. So I've always look at the, all the good things that can happen. And so one other nice part of the book is that she looks at all of the dotting the I's, crossing the T's, making sure you have patents and, you know, all the, and you've done searches and making sure you're not infringing on things. She takes care of all of the, you know, be careful you don't do this or you'll get in trouble down the road type of thing. And, um, and so it's a good combination of experiences uh, for anyone who's launching a new product or wants to take their existing product kind of to the next level. I love it. Uh, I can't wait to get a copy of it myself. Um, now, uh, first of all, the, you mentioned uh, the, the five things to prepare. Is there a certain web link or something we should link to in our show notes? Uh, yeah, if your uh, listeners will go to my personal website, which is rickcesari.com, they can download the five keys to building a great brand. There's a place for them to do that. And then we'll just send it out a link to it automatically. And it's great information. It's not just the five keys, but it's for each key, I give a specific example from one of the products we've talked about um, during the podcast, you know, the first half and this, this one too. So there's real specific examples that can really um, might um, incite some ideas for, for whoever's reading it for the product that they're working with. That's great. Well, it, it really is. Some of these fundamental things are often overlooked and the more prepared you are as always going in, the better off you'll be. So uh, we'll definitely get those links in the show notes page. Uh, when when you think about the book and and so forth, you know what what do you what do you think that people after they read it what what do you think they will do in terms of taking action or what should they do perhaps uh, to, to take action to to uh, you know harness the lessons that found in that book? Yeah, well, one one of the things I talk about because I wanted to write the book from the standpoint uh, of being an entrepreneur and really starting several businesses and then looking at a lot of other businesses that were startups that we worked with through the agency, 
and I wanted to give people out there kind of just foundational information, um, axioms that they should look at that'll really shortcut um, maybe their path to success or launching their product or generating sales. And it's really um, basic fundamental stuff that kept recurring through every product marketing and brand that, that, that we built. And maybe I'm referring it to it as, as um, you know, common sense knowledge, but maybe for, you know, for me, but, you know, you, you know, you, you have a way, I enjoy talking with you, Steve, because you have a way of boiling things down to very simple, um, understandable bullet points for your listeners. And that's what a lot of it is in the book is, um, okay, these brands are recognizable, they're doing big sales, but they started down here and they did these five things. And that is one thing that helped them get up there. And so it's really good information for uh, readers uh, that are, like I said, launching a new product, launching a new business, or taking an existing one and want to take it to the next level. Well, this is this is a great opportunity uh, for everybody out there because, you know, what what's common sense and what is is second nature to Rick at this stage in in his experience is certainly like a foreign language to most of us. I mean, we we don't understand all the things that go into it. So the, the chance to kind of see into his experience and into his mind, along with his, his co-author, uh, is Barb Westerfield? Yeah, Barb Westfield. And I, and just Westfield. real quickly about Barb. She was the CMO at Salton Housewares when the Salton was the company that bought our juicer business, Trillium Health Products. And so I started working with Bob to help Barb to help expand the juicer business. And we had also launched another product at the time, the Bread Man Bread Machine. And we were just doing, you know, not just, but we were, it was probably a three or four million dollar product. She had a personal passion for home cooked bread. And she was able to build that bread machine business into a hundred million dollar business when Salton owned it. And so we kind of hit it off being product marketers together. And she was the CMO through the whole George Foreman Grill. Um, after Salton was sold, she basically started working at a company called Hometics, and she was a CMO at Wolfgang Puck. A, a lot of the housewares, uh, housewares, and she knows more about housewares, forgot more than I'll ever know. And and not know that she she's the one that would do. She's fluent in Mandarin. She goes over to China, deals with all the factories, um, basically the manufacturing end and packaging end and 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 helping get them launched and so we, we also could talk about not just billion dollar brands but i'll give you a really good example uh there's a product that barb and i were involved in barb was a little bit more involved called the sous vide supreme and i don't know if your listeners sous vide is a type of cooking where you cook the product in a water bath and here's a product that's coming out um the, the CEO, CIO, Chief Information Officer at Microsoft, um, wrote a book about this sous vide cooking and kind of put it on the map. And so Barb helped the company uh, develop a machine and really helped grow that business from zero to $50 million, um, really using, again, here's an example of content, Mark. You mentioned content is king and how important it is. Really what that company did was make about 200 recipe videos showing them using the machine. They were on the website and basically built it through content marketing. So, so it's not just about TV. We go into lots of different ways that you can get to the same result, different types of marketing. So uh, it's just the opportunity to learn from people who've been there, done that. And by the way, I, I still have great respect and admiration for somebody who's done it once and, and, you know, they, they got there maybe a little serendipity along the way, but you know, between you and Barb, you guys have done this again and again and again. And, you know, it's, it's at the point now that $50 million businesses are rounding errors, right? You know, it's like, Hey, we can go bigger. So I, I really appreciate the fact that we can learn about, you know, how to build billion dollar brands from somebody so experienced. And I, and I want to just, uh, uh, give you extra gratitude and thanks for your time and, and commitment to sharing with the Ospers out there for this special two-part episode. Yeah, and, and Steve, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to expand on all of these different products and brands, and hopefully the information that we talked about and shared, you did a really great job of pointing out the 
axioms or, or different business lessons from me rambling ab about and telling stories. So you, you do a great job of bringing it back down to the listeners and, and tidbits that they can take, a, take away from it. So I really appreciate that. And also appreciate talking to you from like one entrepreneur to another because you, you get it. You've been through it and um, you're able to ask the right questions, which is, you know, is great for me to be able to, to answer them. So thank well, you. Definitely. It's my pleasure. And it, it really does, you know, for the Oscars out there, listen, you know, when, when you've kind of walked the same path, you've been in the same shoes, it's really easy to see the parallels and it's easy to see the lessons. And that's, that's ultimately the mission of this podcast is to bring brilliant people like Rick on board and share some of those experiences and try to call out some lessons so that people listening can take action. The, the, you listening right now, you can take action and you may be the next billion dollar brand. We don't know if that's what you want. You can do it. There are many ways to do it. And it's not just a single path to get there. There's a lot of ways to do it. So thank you once again, Rick. Uh, and uh, any final words of wisdom for the customers out there? No, just, um, Keep doing what you're doing and learn from other people's experience. I love it. Sage wisdom, as always. Uh, Osmers, we're going to be right back after this. Catalyst 88 was developed to help entrepreneurs achieve their short and long-term goals in e-commerce markets by utilizing the power of shared entrepreneurial wisdom. Entrepreneurship is nothing if not lessons to be learned. Learn from others. Learn from us. I guarantee that we will learn from you. Visit Catalyst88.com because your success is our success. A giddy up. Boy, Rick always delivers, right? He just delivers the goods and his experience and his willingness to share. Uh, it's it just his enthusiasm. It's all contagious. And you really see, you know, how you can architect from, you know, basically just any small thing, as long as you have a good idea and as long as you really understand margin and how to put things together, uh, you can do it. You could build a billion dollar brand. One of the things you should have as a takeaway is you can shortcut and you can grab all of Rick's extraordinary experience by buying his book, uh, Building Billion Dollar Brands, to help you grab that valuable knowledge that the big brands already know. The big guys know this stuff. They have guys like Rick uh, or Rick himself on the payroll. And now the small guys, the inventors, the small business owners, the entrepreneurs, the Amazon sellers, uh, the e-commerce uh, folks out there, and really anybody who's got a creative idea, now you can have that same arsenal of information right at your fingertips uh, by buying the book. So I can't wait uh, to buy the book. I think I've actually already pre-ordered it on Amazon uh, at the time I record this, but the time you're listening to this, it's live. Go buy it right now. Don't hesitate. Let's, let's do the right thing and get this thing done. I know that you will be highly rewarded as a result of this, and I hope that you see that building a billion dollar brand is not just some lucky magic strike, you know, lightning just happened to hit this one lucky guy. Rick has been able to do this over and over. And if if you've heard of OxyClean, if you've heard of GoPro, if you've heard of the George Foreman grill or the ultrasonic toothbrush, those are all brands that were built and uh, developed, you know, over the course of time on direct response media. And that, to me, is one of my favorite kinds of advertising because, because it's dollar in, as I, we talked about, the funnel, money, dollars go in the top, and money comes out in the bottom. That's what makes it sustainable. That's what makes it replicatable. And that's what makes a truly amazing business that can scale. Now, this has been Awesomers.com episode number 56. And I know this is a back-to-back -back episode. They're kind of long, but all you have to do is go to Awesomers.com slash 56 to get the show notes and details. This has been a power-packed back-to-back series. I hope you have loved it as much as I did. Well, we've done it again, everybody. We have another episode of the Awesomers podcast ready for the world. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you've enjoyed our program today. Now's a good time to take a moment to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. Heck, you can even leave a, a review if you wanted. Awesomers around you will appreciate your help. It's only with your participation and sharing that we'll be able to achieve our goals. Our success is literally in your hands. Thank you again for joining us. We are at your service. Find out more about me, Steve Simonson, our guest, team, and all the other Osmers involved at Osmers.com. Thank you again.